Welcome to the Institute of Catholic Culture, a nonprofit Catholic organization dedicated to the re-evangelization of our society through educational and cultural programs offered to the public at no charge. This and other presentations, hundreds of hours of audio, are available for free on our website, www.instituteofcatholicculture.org. There you can listen to or download educational programs related to all aspects of our divine faith, and you can review our schedule of upcoming events. We hope you can join us in person. We'll begin in prayer in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. O Master who loves mankind, illuminate our hearts with the pure light of your divine knowledge and open the eyes of our mind to understand the teachings of your Holy Church. Instill in us also the fear of your blessed commandments that we may overcome all carnal desires, entering upon a spiritual life and understanding and acting in all things according to your holy will. For you are the enlightenment of our souls and bodies, O Christ God. And to you we give glory together with your eternal Father and your all holy, gracious, and life giving spirit, both now and ever and unto ages of ages. Amen. It's a blessing to be with all of you tonight. Uh, and to be able to introduce my brother, Father Sebastian, once again, to welcome him back to the Institute of Catholic Culture. I said I want to forego the normal bio because I could list all of his degrees and accomplishments, his PhD from Catholic University, his master's degree, and so forth. But more importantly than all of those things, he is one of those men, I would say, that uh, Pope Benedict was talking about, one who understands the grandeur of the faith, the fullness of the faith, and can make that a reality, uh, attempts and tries to make that a reality in his own life, and to be able to share that with his parishioners and all those that he teaches. We're blessed to be here with him as he guides us through this uh, series, Blood and Water, an understanding of the sacraments of initiation. I want to give a little, just a little bit of an introduction, and maybe even a little bit of a warning sign to you as you begin. Uh, I've said to you before, as we learn the faith, we grow. We truly grow. And just as we grow bodily, so we grow spiritually. And when we grow bodily, oftentimes at nighttime, my kids wake up and what do they say to me? Daddy, my leg's hurting. My leg's hurting. <clears throat> His leg's hurting because he's having growing pains. And this oftentimes happens in theology. When we grow in our, in our, in our theological knowledge, Sometimes that growth can be painful, and oftentimes we fight against it because, you know what, it doesn't always conform with our preconceived notions. A good theologian is a theologian who is open to the truths of the faith as taught by the church, and I'm so blessed. All of us are blessed uh, over the next few hours together to be able to learn not what Father Sebastian thinks, what Father Hezekiah thinks, what the church truly teaches. And when we learn what the church truly teaches, oftentimes we, uh, uh, we go down roads which we may not have gone down before or may not have even realized existed before. Mm -hmm. It's a blessing to be here with my brother. Father Sebastian, welcome back. Thank you. It's good to be here. We are talking about the sacraments of initiation. The title of this talk, Blood and Water, of course, is a reference to John 1934. John 1934, which many of the fathers of the church saw as an image, the blood and water flowing from Christ's side, an image of the gift of the sacraments. Sometimes you'll hear, that's the birth of the church. And you might be thinking, well, which one is it? Well, it's the same thing. You can't talk about the church, you can't talk about Christianity without talking about the sacraments. This is one and the same thing. And so as St. Augustine saw the opening in Christ's side, the opening of the door through which the church was born or through which the sacraments flowed, the sacraments cannot be limited down to those simple images of blood and water, of course, but the fathers of the church are speaking in a theological poetry there. They're talking about how Christ's death and resurrection, the Paschal event, is what gives us the church, what makes us who we are as Christians today. So the sacraments of initiation, the sacraments of initiation, 
before we get too far ahead of ourselves, we need to talk about what are these things. Well, first of all, what is a sacrament? What is a sacrament? You may have different ideas in your head. You may uh, uh, may remember uh, your catechesis as a child uh, of what that meant, you know. But what is a sacrament? Basically, it boils down to this: a sacrament, a a holy thing, okay, a thing that which is set apart to use that English word coming from the Latin, or from the New Testament Greek, a mystery, a mystery, a holy mystery, which helps us also understand that this is not something that you can figure out every aspect of it and understand, but rather there are, there are aspects of the sacraments, which you might say, I know what water is, or I know what oil is, or I understand the idea of the Holy Spirit. Or, well, Probably, first of all, the answer to all those is, well, not really, if we look into it. But this, the sacraments in the end are mysteries. God is a mystery. The Holy Trinity, the greatest mystery of our faith. And when God acts, we experience mystery. When he acts, he reveals himself. And so his acts are mystery. More on that later. But first of all, we need to understand that a sacrament has different parts to it. And again, in a theological course, we could get into great detail, and I'm sure the Institute has provided courses like that for you on sacramental theology. But basically, I want you to understand, if you look at the sacraments and all the explanations of them, it boils down to this, that sacraments have two basic components to them. There is a physical or a material and an immaterial aspect, a material and an immaterial aspect. The material aspect is something which is fairly obvious. There is water, there is bread, there is oil, there is wine, something like that. The immaterial aspect is something that the modern man, even modern Christians often neglect, uh, disregard, maybe even reject. But that's a problem because the sacraments are both material and immaterial because we are material and immaterial. So the sacraments are made for us. They are made for us who are both material and immaterial. The spiritual reality or the immaterial aspect of a sacrament is intended to restore our immaterial or spiritual aspect to what we were once were supposed to be. The material aspect of a sacrament is intended to restore that material, that creature, water, oil, to what it was intended to be. We spoke about this before in other lectures with the Institute of how important it is to understand salvation as a restoration, salvation as a restoration. St. Athanasius the Great, when he begins to talk about the incarnation, his great work on the incarnation begins with these words in the prologue. The first thing you must understand is this, that there is no difference between creation and salvation. For God used the same word, to create the world as to save it. I'm summarizing here. So we have to understand that what we're in salvation history, when we're talking about the sacraments, when we're talking about the church, we first of all need to understand is what, what we're dealing with is a restoration of God's original plan, a restoration of the original purpose of mankind, a restoration of the original purpose of creation, the original purpose of water or oil and so on. And so the sacraments have a physical and spiritual aspect because we have a spiritual and physical aspect. So what are the sacraments of initiation? We can talk a lot about the other different sacraments and things like that, but we don't have time to do that tonight. Our focus tonight is on the sacraments of initiation. What are they? What are they? When you think of the sacraments of initiation, what comes to mind? Hmm? Susan Glover? Are you there? Are you able to chime in? Yes. 
Baptism, Confirmation, and Holy Eucharist. Very good. Excellent. Excellent. The Sacraments of Initiation. And that was quite interesting, the order you gave me, Susan. Susan, were you baptized as an infant? Yes. And when were you confirmed? When I was uh, probably 12, 13. And then after that, you received your first communion? No, before. Well, wait a minute. You, I'm not following. You, you're telling me you were baptized, then you, were con you, you received your first communion at around yeah. age 7 or so, and then you received, you were confirmed at age 12? Right. Baptism, Eucharist, confirmation. But give me the list that you, you gave me a list when I asked the question in a different order. What was the order you, you said initially? Baptism, confirmation, Holy Eucharist. That's it right. really should be baptism, Holy Eucharist, confirmation. Well, Susan, I'm giving you a hard time for a reason and to make I a know. point. You're <laughs> right. You're right in what you said initially in that order. And we're going to get to that tonight. Okay, this is a very important issue, the order of the sacraments. Are there any converts here who are logged in with a microphone? David? David, are you a convert? Yes, I am. Tell me about your, your conversion experience. Were you, did you come from a different denomination, or did you come out of, out of uh, something else? Or? I was uh, born and raised Methodist. Methodist, okay. And so uh, you, were, you were baptized as a baby, probably? Yes. In the Methodist Church. And then when you came into the Catholic Church, what happened? Uh, I took a uh, profession of faith, took Eucharist, and then the bishop, about a month later, came to the cathedral to confirm us. Oh. Now that is a little different than what happens usually with a convert. Most of you probably are familiar with, tragic, the tragedy if not, you're hopefully familiar with the conversion of adults and the initiation of adults into your local parish and the process that we see take place in the beautiful Paschal Liturgy. Now, if you think back to Pascha, to Easter, if you want to call it that, you hopefully recall seeing some adults standing there at the baptismal font. You hopefully saw them baptized, if they need to be baptized, and then they were confirmed. Then they received the Eucharist, right? Normally, in most large Roman Catholic parishes, you have at least a few, hopefully, a few people coming into the church. If they're coming from Buddhism, you're going to see them baptized that night. While they're still dripping with water, you're going to see them then confirmed, and then you're going to see them receive communion. If they come from a standard Christian denomination, and it can be determined with surety that the person has been baptized validly, such as in most forms of Methodism or Presbyterianism or Lutheran. I'm saying most because things vary there. It has to be investigated on an individual basis. But if the person has already been baptized as an infant, say as with David, typically what you will see then is the person confirmed because the baptism had already taken place, and then they received Holy Communion. In David's case, the bishop was coming shortly after, and so the priest probably wanted to reserve that for the bishop to be nice. But in many parishes, the priest becomes the, the he's the extraordinary. On, on, on the night of Pascha, he is the ordinary at that moment by special permission, given jurisdiction to confirm also in the absence of the bishop. Okay? But notice the order there. Notice the order. That is very important, as we'll see. Now, that's converts. You say, well, wait, maybe it has to do with converts, huh? Well, it has something, there's something else going on. Let me ask another question. Is there anyone here, and again, I can't see all the faces on the screen. I wish you could see everyone. But 
I'm going to assume that there is somebody in the 171 people logged in. There is somebody here who was born in Mexico, Guatemala, Brazil, Argentina, someone from Central or South America, I would imagine, if not many, logged in tonight. Anyone logged in here from the Philippines? Not necessarily there tonight, but maybe here in the United States, but who was born and raised a child, at least in the Philippines. Go back and check your baptismal records. You were baptized as an infant. Then you were confirmed somewhere in the next two to three years of your life, whenever the bishop showed up. And then around age seven, you received your first communion. Any of you DREs or catechists logged in tonight in the United States, make sure you pay attention to that information. If some kid comes to enter into your first communion class or a 12-year-old fresh out of Mexico City or something like that or from Manila, you better check before you sign them up for your confirmation class because most likely they were already confirmed as an infant, but they're not converts. Why is that? Because in Central and South America and in the Philippines, under Spanish influence from the Spanish church, there was a preservation, and we can't get into the history of it tonight. We'll talk about it another night, of the original apostolic order of these sacraments. The Spanish church often maintains, probably due to its distance from the Reformation geographically in Europe, often maintains older pre-Reformation customs that have since been lost in other regions of the Roman church. More on that in our last talk next week. So I want you to think of the word baptism. And I want you to think of the few words that might come to your mind when I say baptism. Okay, we're going to play a little game here. Baptism. I want you to write three words down quickly. This is, a, this is one of those psychology games, words of association. From those three words, you'll develop your lecture on baptism for me at a, at a later date. Okay, so what are these three key words? Essential words that you've got to talk about if you're going to talk about baptism. All right? Okay, Andy, I'm going to give you a hard time. Andy, give me, give me your three, quickly. Okay, creation, regain, and I'm cheating, divine life. What do you mean you're cheating? Did you look up something? Two no, months. that's just two at the end. Oh, I see. Okay, all right. Good. All right, so now, uh, how about Eric? Give me three. I had uh, uh, death, resurrection, and water. Okay, good. Edwin? Uh, I wrote down um, water, minister, and subject of the person. Okay. Angela, did you write anything down? I don't have paper, but I was going to say seal, water, and resurrection. Okay. All right, good. The most important word there, and the word that is typically not considered, is resurrection. Resurrection. Okay? When you think of baptism, if resurrection is not coming to mind, you're a heretic. And I'm being nice. All right? So... You have to think of the word resurrection. If you want to be an apostolic Christian, if you want to be in accord with the New Testament writers, if you want to be in accord with the, the fathers of the church, if you want to be in accord with the tradition of the church, if you want to be in accord with the catechism says on baptism, you've got to think resurrection. Okay? We'll come back to that later. Now, I want you to think of, here's another one. Here's another game. Eucharist. Okay? The Eucharist. Write three words down on Eucharist, okay? Three words that you think of. When, you say, when I say Eucharist, you think of a word. Then I say, give me another word. And then I give me another word, okay? All right, Edwin, go. Total blanking beyond bread. But okay, you give me bread. Give me another one. Quickly, I'm putting you on the spot on purpose. Um, community. Community, okay. Re reconnection, or... Um, it's not resurrection, but... Uh... All right, that's okay. This is good, Edmund. Ed, these, these are very good, and it's important to, to make the point here. Angela, 
Three, give me. Body, blood, um, remembrance. Okay. David? Bread, wine, salvation. Bread, wine, salvation. Nice, nice. Actually, Father, there's a couple of people have been writing them in. We've got blood, bread, life, preservation, wedding feast, food, thanksgiving, thanksgiving, nourishment, sacrifice. Awesome. It made my very point. Heresy. They're missing a very important word. It's the words of Jesus, by the way, so we need to take, take note here. Resurrection. Resurrection. When we're talking about the sacraments of initiation, baptism, confirmation, and Eucharist. Baptism is the first, and confirmation is, as we'll see, part of the baptismal ceremony originally. It's, it's really one topic. And then the Eucharist. The key term for both of those, and unites both of them, what you're going to see in the catechism is resurrection. What did Jesus say? Look, look, let me ask you another question. If your Baptist friend asks you, where in the Bible is the Eucharist? Where are you going to go? Right? Catholics have two passages of the Bible memorized. Matthew 16 and John 6. Right? So you're going to say, John 6, you must eat my flesh and drink my blood. What does Jesus say? He eats my flesh and drinks my blood, has life in him, and I will raise him up on the last day. And I will raise him up on the last day. Resurrection. You think, I don't usually think of the Eucharist as something that has to do with resurrection. I know that. That's why we're having this class. That's why the Institute of Catholic Culture exists. Okay, so I want you to remember what we just that exercise we just went through, and remember that this happens on a daily basis. Always be ready to give a reason for the faith which is within you, right? Peter said that in his first his first epistle. Nobody seems to have listened. Right? We have to have an, a reason for the faith. If someone asks you what is the Eucharist, and we we can't even come up with three key words. We got a problem, right? If someone asks us, what is baptism? And we don't, and the word resurrection doesn't come up. Or why is, why do we receive the Eucharist and resurrection doesn't come up? Then we've got a problem. And if you want to see the problem, look around you on Sunday, right? The churches are emptying across the nation in many dioceses. They're closing up so fast. They can't get real estate agents hired fast enough to do it for them, okay? Catholic churches are being turned into roller rinks and restaurants. The evangelicals are buying them up. Because a Catholic can't even enunciate three key words about the faith, right? There's a problem. Ask the average, uh, what is the, uh, the statistics? I'm, I'm not current on them, but I, I think I recall in the past something like 70 75% of Catholics who attend church on Sunday, okay, these are the, these ones actually are there, uh, don't believe in the real presence of the Eucharist? No, really? <laughs> it's the statistics. So there's a problem. What's the problem? Well, how can they, what are they to believe? How do they understand it? They don't even know what the church teaches about it. What do Catholics know about the Eucharist? It's the real body and blood of Jesus. That's just apologetics. That's the answer your Baptist friend is, is needing here, right? It's not the real body and blood. So the Catholic says it is the real body and blood. They go back and forth and hit each other with the Bible in John 6. But John 6 is not apologetics against the Baptist. The Eucharist was not intended as a thing to convert Baptists. Okay? There's something missing there. We, we have to go beyond apologetics. Okay, so key, resurrection. Now, someone said eternal life. Someone said salvation. David said salvation, I think. So these are key words, and salvation is resurrection. Eternal life, resurrection. Just want to make sure you, you understand it. And we're going to talk more about this next week when we talk about the Eucharist, okay? All right, so let's move to our first major topic, the first of the three sacraments of initiation, baptism. Baptism is the doorway to the other sacraments. Baptism is the doorway to the other sacraments. It is the first of the sacraments of initiation. In fact, it is the first of all sacraments. 
Now, when I ask, what is the next sacrament? What's the next doorway you walk through? There's going to be some confusion out there, as we already saw in the beginning. And that's, again, part of the purpose of our course this week and next week. But baptism is the doorway to, if you want to talk about these as distinct sacraments, it is the doorway to confirmation. But the early church, in fact, we're going to see in the catechism, doesn't talk about it that way. What the catechism is trying to do, as we're going to see, is restore an earlier understanding of the relationship of these two liturgical events, baptism and confirmation, as one liturgical event, as one sacramental event. Because in the early church, that's what it was. So, baptism. Baptism, what is it? Well, we can start by talking about the name. Baptizing, right? Baptizing. This is a Greek word. To baptize. To immerse. To immerse. That's literally what it means. It doesn't mean just to get wet. It doesn't mean to pour water over your head. It means to dunk, to immerse, to submerge under the water. Okay? With normally with the intent of washing. Okay, you normally don't just grab something and put it under water for fun in the ancient world. You're usually doing that for a reason. And when they did that, it was for the intent of washing typically all right you can see the word by the way if you look in mark chapter 7 uh, in a non-sacramental context where you see jesus talking about the washing of hands and the tradition you remember the pharisees engaging jesus on that and mark jumps in and gives you a little commentary about the pharisees and talks about how they like to wash or dunk all of their vessels before they use them Okay, so baptizing. Now, when you hear that immerse or submerge, you think, wait a minute, I, 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 I hear what you're saying there, but I think most experiences today of baptism in most Roman Catholic churches is not submersing underwater. There, there's something else going on. We're familiar with pouring a little trinkle of water over someone's head, right? That is not the early church ideal practice. That was allowed from as early as the Didache, as an emergency baptism. That was your backup plan. But that was not the normal way baptism was done. Baptism was always done in the early church, as we're going to see the catechism talking about this, with full immersion under the water three times. We'll see why in a second. Okay, so baptism, it means dunking, dunking under the water. Okay, so why do we do it? Why do we baptize? Because that's what the apostles did. Why did the apostles do it? Because that's what Jesus said to do. Remember that thing we call the creed on Sundays we recite, right? We are one holy Catholic and apostolic. Apostolic, we really mean that. Unfortunately, we usually don't pay too much attention to that aspect. You saw... Uh, my brother talking earlier before the lecture tonight about all of the wonderful lectures that are planned for the ICC. You saw how many topics engaged Cyril of Jerusalem, uh, Cyril of Alexandria, St. Justin Martyr, the early church fathers, right? Augustine, Jerome. Very important, very important to understand the apostles and the apostolic era and the fathers that, who were taught under them if we're going to understand what it means to be an apostolic church. Okay, so the apostles taught us to baptize because Jesus told them to baptize. We baptize because it is apostolic. It is an apostolic tradition. We do it because that's what it means to be Christian, an apostolic Christian. So then where do we find that? Let's look at a couple of examples in our Bible. Let's look at some examples of some New Testament teaching on baptism. Turn with me to John chapter 3. This is Jesus early in his ministry talking about baptism. You know this story well. 
Now, when there was a man of the Pharisees named Nicodemus, a ruler of the Jews, this man came to Jesus by night and said to him, Rabbi, we know that you are a teacher come from God, for no one can do these, these signs that you do unless God is with him. Verse 3, Jesus said to him, Truly, truly, I say to you, unless one is born again, born anew, born from above, literally in the Greek, he cannot see the kingdom of God. What does that mean? What does he mean, born again? And you might have Christians today arguing about that. I mean, it means this. No, it means that. It means, well, just keep reading. All you got to do is just keep reading. Right? Look what it says. Jesus then explains what he means. When Nicodemus is confused about this, thinking he's going to have to go see his mom again, it says, verse 5, Truly, truly, I say to you, unless one is born of water and the Spirit, he cannot enter into the kingdom of God. Water and the Spirit. Now, You've got to read all of these things in context, of course. If you go back to chapter 1, you hear about Jesus' baptism where the Spirit of God hovered over Jesus. Right? You have the water and the Spirit there. And then at the end of chapter 3, the last line uh, says here in um, verse 22, after that his disciples went off baptizing. Right? So you can see the baptismal imagery. Any commentary by any biblical scholar with a PhD after the name. I don't care whether a Baptist, a Lutheran, a Catholic, whatever they're, any biblical scholar with a PhD after his name is going to tell you the line there, being born again or born from above, literally in the Greek, is a reference to being born of water and the Spirit. It's a reference to early episodic teaching on baptism. Okay, so water and the Spirit. I remember walking into a Baptist church one time, and I was standing in the back, and the preacher was pacing back and forth in his nice Hawaiian shirt, and he was talking about being born again. And he was telling, he was about to go for the altar call. He was getting really fired up and talking about how you've got to be born again. He went on, and I said, listen, let's go see what the Bible says. So he started reading in John chapter 6, or John chapter 3. And as he read this, he, he read verse 3, you've got to be born again. And he went on for another 20 minutes. And then he said, Let's see what Jesus means about that. He kept reading. Jesus keeps talking. So he read, and he read this, verse 5. Truly, truly, I say to you, unless one is born of water and the Spirit, he cannot enter the kingdom of God. And he froze like that in front of his congregation. <laughs> there was a real epiphany. All right, so he suddenly realized, as you know, Baptists don't teach at the popular level without their high-level center education. They just pass on this idea that being born again is some sort of a you know, spiritual indigestion you have or something. But he realized that if you look at John's gospel, if you read a sequence of these stories, Jesus always says something, then there's confusion, then he explains what he said in more detail. You can see his pattern over and over in John's gospel. And he knew enough about John's gospel, obviously, to figure that out all of a sudden. Unfortunately, it happened right there in the middle of the sermon. All right. So water and the spirit. To enter into the kingdom of God, to enter into the church, to be saved, to enter into a state of reconciliation to God. You must be born of water and the spirit. Notice the order. It doesn't say spirit and water. It says water and the spirit. See the order there? Okay. All right. So that's John chapter 3. Now that's early in Jesus' ministry, very early. At the end of Jesus' ministry, you can turn to the end of Matthew's gospel to see this. This is what Jesus says about it. This is Matthew chapter 28, a text you probably know well. Matthew chapter 28, verse 19. This is after the resurrection. Chapter 28 of Matthew. Verse 19, go therefore and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe all that I have commanded you. And lo, I am with you always, even to the end of the age. Right? That means I'm, that's Semitic words to say, I'm going to be with you forever. Okay. All right. So he commands his disciples to go out and baptize. Go out and baptize. Now, when we turn to Acts, particularly chapter 2, we see the early church doing what Jesus commanded to do. Turn to Acts chapter 2. You know the story of Pentecost. The Holy Spirit descends upon the apostles. And then Peter gives that beautiful long speech reciting salvation history in many ways and the importance of the coming of the Christ. 
And then verse 37, this is chapter 2, verse 37. Now when they heard this, they were cut to the heart and said to Peter and the rest of the apostles, Brethren, what shall we do? And Peter said to them, Repent and say the Jesus prayer. And oh no, and repent and say the, the, the sinner's prayer. Re, no, look what it says. Repent and be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus the Christ, for the forgiveness of of your sins. Not as, as you might hear in a, a Baptist church, not as some sort of a public demonstration that you're a Christian with no sacramental effect. No, no, for the forgiveness of your sins. And look what it says. And look at the semicolon there. If you have an RSV, semicolon. And you shall receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. Do you see that? And you shall receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. Now, I want to come back to that after the break. The fact that there's really two parts there. There's two parts which aren't so clear to you now, which will be more clear when we talk about confirmation. But notice that semicolon and then, and you shall receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. Okay? So Peter's talking about a baptism which gives you the forgiveness of sins, provided you've repented, of course. And then he talks about a gift of the Holy Spirit, which will follow. And of course, you know the rest of the story, and we've talked about Pentecost on other occasions. There are many more examples of baptism in the New Testament. We'll return to those later in our discussion of confirmation. And in fact, that point of there being the two parts as we talked about. Now, those are the commands to baptize. But what is what is it? I mean, we talked about it. It's a dunking, yes, but... What does it mean? Why, do, why is it so important? Well, the New Testament authors didn't leave us with that question. They left us with an answer. We find in the New Testament authors a number of places where they explain why baptism is so important, why Jesus commanded, why it's an apostolic institution. Turn with me to Galatians 3.27. One of the first and most important images, and I believe someone, I can't remember who it is, gave us this term tonight, a new creation. Turn with me to Galatians 3.27. We'll look at it in context there, not just that verse, because there's a, it's very rich. This is chapter 3, verse 26. In Christ, you are all sons of God. Now, look at that word, in. In. Right? If you had a Pauline course with me, you've got that underlined maybe 300 times. In. In Christ, you are all sons of God. Why? Because Jesus is the Son of God, right? He's going to tell us that in a second. He says, and then verse 27, For as many of you who were baptized into Christ... You were baptized into Christ. Once you've been baptized into Christ, then you're in Christ, right? So, okay. You were baptized into Christ, have put on Christ. The language there is like putting on a garment, putting on a robe. There is neither slave nor free. There is neither male nor female, for you are all one in Christ Jesus. And if you are Christ, then you are Abraham's offspring. Heirs, according to the promise. How in the world could you become David? Do you are you? Do you have any Jewish blood in you? Not that I'm aware of. What's Saint Paul talking about? Well, Jesus did, right? Jesus is the descendant, the seed of Abraham, Genesis twelve three, through which all the nations shall be blessed. And if you are baptized into Christ and are then in Christ, once you've been baptized into Him, now you're in Him. You are a son of God. How is it? Because God, Jesus is the son of God. And if that's the case, then you are not male nor female. You are not slave nor free. You're not Jew nor Gentile. You're, you are all one in Christ. In Christ. We become members of his bodies. We'll talk about in a second. And if you are Christ, then you are Abraham's offspring, heirs according to the promise. Heirs according to the promise. Right? This reference back to Genesis. 
Okay, so that's new creation imagery. You've been recreated. St. Paul will talk about this in other places. Turn with me now to Romans chapter 6. Romans chapter 6. This is read. This is the official liturgical text to be read at every liturgical baptism in every liturgical apostolic church in the world. Okay, Greek Orthodox, Russian Orthodox, Melkite, Byzantine Catholic, Coptic, Ethiopian, Roman Catholic, Ambrosian, Gallican Rite, I don't care what. Romans chapter 6 is always read at a liturgical baptism. An emergency, other things happen, of course. But Romans chapter 6, this means the church sees this as very important for enunciating what is baptism. Look what it says. What shall we say then? Are we to continue in sin that grace may abound by no means? How can we who died to sin still live in it? Do you not know that all of us who have been baptized into Christ, look at that language again, baptized into Christ Jesus, were baptized into his death. Well, that doesn't sound very nice. Baptized into his death. Right? Do we think of baptism as a death? Look what he says. We were buried, therefore, with him by baptism into death. You can see the reason why the early church used the full submersion. You get that imagery of being buried. So that, underline so that, maybe 300 times, circle it and put little stars and bells and whistles around it, okay? So that. So why? Why Why is it important to die with Christ, be buried with him? Why? Why? So that, as Christ was raised from the dead by the glory of the Father, we too might walk in newness of life. For as it, if we have been united with him in a death like his, we shall certainly be united with him in a, back, in a resurrection like his. We know that our old self was crucified with him so the sinful body might be destroyed and we might no longer be enslaved to sin. For he who died is freed from sin. But if we have died with Christ, we believe that we shall live with him. For we know that Christ, being raised from the dead, will never die again. Death no longer has dominion over him. The death he died, he died to sin once for all. But the life he lives, he lives to God. So also you must consider yourselves dead to sin and alive to God. Look at this. In. You see that? In Christ Jesus. In Christ Jesus. Okay. Baptism gives us a death and a resurrection. We enter into the paschal mystery of Jesus. We die, we're buried, and we're raised from the dead by the power of God. All right, that's the new creation imagery. In fact, Cyril of Jerusalem in his mystagogical catechesis, one of those important, if not the most important, patristic text on early church teaching on baptism. And initiation. Cyril Jerusalem's mystagogical catechesis. He says, Why do we baptize with three immersions, three dunks? Because Christ died and was buried for three days. So you participate in the three days of the Paschal mystery. Now we often think, Well, yeah, but there's Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Absolutely. This is baptizing the Father the Son, and the Holy Spirit. But the Father saw, as St. Paul talks about here, this is a death and resurrection. And so there's also something else going on here. It's a, it's a participation in the Paschal mystery of Christ. All right. We become a new creation, a new creation through this. You can make a note for yourself. We don't have time to look at all of these passages. You can also put down a note, Galatians 6.16. Galatians 6.16 and 2 Corinthians 517, 2 Corinthians 517, a new creation. Why? Because in the first creation, everything came from the water, right? The Spirit was hovering over the water. Think of Genesis 1. And then God spoke, and then immediately everything begins, begins to come from the water. We see the water part, the dry land appear, then the plants and and, and Animals come from the dry land, and most importantly, man, drawn from the mud. Right? We are born of the water, but not just the water, by the power of the Spirit hovering over that water of creation. Okay? 
That's why, that's why the fathers of the church, that's why the New Testament authors talk about baptism like a new creation. There's more to that, and we'll talk about that next week. Another image we find in the New Testament for baptism, another explanation, a theological explanation of what is baptism, is it's like the flood with Noah. Turn to 1 Peter chapter 3. 1 Peter chapter 3. He talks about Christ when he had died and while he was in the tomb. He says this, chapter 3, verse 18. For Christ also died for sins once for all, the righteous for the unrighteous, that he might, right, why? To bring us to God, to restore us to God, right? Being put to death in the flesh, but made alive in the spirit, in which he went and preached to the spirits in prison who formerly did not obey, when God's patience waited in the days of Noah during the building of the ark, in which a few, that is, eight persons, were saved through water. Baptism, which corresponds to this, now saves you. Not as a removal of dirt from the body, but as an appeal to God for a clear conscience through the highlight 300 times resurrection, the resurrection of Jesus Christ. Right? He's the pioneer. He's gone into heaven before. He's the pioneer of our salvation. Right? He was raised from the dead, so we will be raised from the dead through baptism in him. Okay, so look at that. Why does why does Saint Peter talk about baptism? or initiation of the church like a, a new flood. Well, what happened in the flood? Right? You have wicked mankind, but you have one that is righteous, Noah. Right? This is the image of man going from wickedness to repentance. You have a man who decides to go from this wicked world, and he decides to repent. And then if he repents, he is baptized in the waters of the flood baptized in the waters of creation, now baptized in the waters of the new creation. The story of the flood is Genesis 1 all over again, right? The waters came back upon the earth and everything died. It's all snuffed out. It's a reversal of creation. But then God sent his wind or his spirit there in the Hebrew, in the Greek, to part the waters of the flood so the dry land could appear. And as you read the story, you can see it's Genesis 1 all over again. You have Noah and those who come forth out of the ark come out in a, they're like the new Adam, the new creation. And so St. Peter says this is what baptism's like. The new man coming forth from the ark, the new Adam coming out of the ark through the waters of the flood or the waters of baptism. Again, you can see this full immersion, the reason why they preferred that. Okay, and then a third image, a third image the new Israel. So we're talking about a new creation, a new Noah, or a new Adam, maybe, if you want. And then a new Israel, which is also a new Adam and new creation, too. But this is all the same themes. But a new Israel, or a new creation as Israel was. Turn with me to 1 Corinthians chapter 10. 1 Corinthians chapter 10. I want you to know, brethren, that our fathers were all under the cloud and all passed through the sea and all were baptized into Moses. What? Moses? That's right. Moses was the mediator of the old covenant. It was through Moses who gave us the law that Israel was united to God. They were baptized into Moses in the cloud and in the sea. The cloud and the sea. There's your spirit and water. And all ate the same supernatural food and all drank the same supernatural drink, for they drank from the supernatural rock which followed them, and that rock was Christ. And he goes on to talk about the liturgical practice of the Corinthian church and the Eucharist and the things that are going on there. Notice he compares baptism to Corinthians. A, he compares it to the Israelites having gone through the Red Sea. The waters parted. The dry land appeared. How that happened? Because the wind. You remember the wind, the spirit. If you go back and look at the story there, it's the same word. In the Hebrew, in the Greek, it's the same word. Spirit, wind. You can take your English. That's what, you might have one or the other, but you have 
ruach in the Hebrew, or pnevma, spirit, which came and parted the waters of the Red Sea, and the dry land appeared, and Israel went through on dry land, and then the waters came back upon the wicked Egyptians, like the wicked in the flood, and washed them away. And who was left at the end? Israel on dry land. And of course, then they were given the menu. We'll talk more about that next week. Water and the spirit here, or the cloud and the sea, and then immediately look at this, the Eucharist, the imagery of the Eucharist. More on that next week. Now, that's the crossing of the sea. St. Paul talks about the, the, our baptism or our full initiation of the church like Israel coming out of Egypt. Why? Because we leave this pagan world, like the Israelites left pagan Egypt. This is why it's so important to understand that Egypt was not a place of physical enslavement so much as a place of spiritual enslavement. Otherwise, you completely misunderstand why the New Testament authors make this comparison. Egypt was a place where Israel was yoked to the pagan gods. And Israel went out of Egypt. They refused to continue to, to live that way. They united themselves to the one true God. They left Egypt, and having repented of that past, of that darkness of this world, they entered into the baptismal font of the Red Sea with Moses and came out on the other side, a son of God, with the Spirit of God hovering over them. And so the fathers of the church, the New Testament authors, saw the cross of the Red Sea as an important image, then, of baptism, a way to understand it. Now, there's a lot more there. Again, we, can't, we could spend a whole hour just on each one of these little uh, passages. But in the New Testament, we also find a very important image, as the Catechism has shown us, for baptism, and that is the baptism of Jesus. The baptism of Jesus, the record of it is recorded in Matthew chapter 3, Mark chapter 1, and Luke chapter 3. Matthew 3, Mark 1, Luke 3, and the reference to it, a reference to it is also found in John chapter 1. In all of these stories, we hear the same details. Jesus crossed the Jordan. He was baptized by John on the Jordan River, and he came out onto the dry land. When he came out of the water, the Spirit hovered over him. God said, Behold, my son. It was revelatory of who Jesus was. That he, was a, he was shown to be the Christ. The anointed one. We'll talk about that after the break. Okay? He was shown to be the Christ. Now, after that, he goes out into the wilderness for 40 days, right? Like Israel for 40 years. And the reason why for us it's a little confusing is because the first century Christians, like the fathers of the church, like we see in Psalm 114, like we see in the book of Joshua, saw the cross in the Red Sea and the crossing of the Jordan as parallel events, bookends on the Exodus story. Okay, so Jesus, the new Joshua, crossing the Jordan or crossing the Red Sea, one event, Psalm 114. Oh, Jordan, why do you turn back? Oh, sea, why do you flee? You know the, the psalm. Okay, so there's, again, an, an image there of the, the, of the baptism, the most important image in the end for us to understand what is baptism, is the baptism of Jesus. We're going to see in the catechism after the break. And finally, I would remind you of one last passage, you can write this down, Colossians chapter 2, where St. Paul says that we are baptized into the body of Christ. We, don't know, we no longer have a physical circumcision, we have a spiritual circumcision. How? Because Jesus was physically circumcised, and if you've been baptized into him, then you are circumcised. So how is that? Because St. Paul really believed what he was talking about here, you become a member of the body of Christ. You can also make a note for yourself to Ephesians 5, Romans chapter 12, 1 Corinthians chapter 12, I could go on, all the places where St. Paul talks about Christians as members of the body of Christ. And this, of course, returns us to the first passage we looked at, Galatians 3.27, where through baptism we have put on Christ like a garment, we become a member of his body. We become a child of God. How? Because Jesus is the Son of God. Now, there's a lot more to talk about baptism, but we can't do it without chrismation or confirmation, which we'll talk about 
after the break, which we're going to take right now. Father, if you're ready, we'll jump right back in here. All right. So we looked at the Old and New Testament imagery that the Bible provides for us to understand baptism. Now, I want you to think about how different what we just saw was from what may have been in your head or maybe someone who's not so familiar with the ICC, who in their head of what is baptism, right? And now you see the problem. The average Christian is not understanding baptism in the way the New Testament explained it. The average Christian is not understanding baptism the way the fathers of the church understood it. And it's not just due to a lack of, you know, maybe reading your Bible once in a while. I remember one time talking to a Protestant minister who had been to seminary, and we were talking about baptism. And we were talking about infant baptism, and as you know, many Protestant churches don't baptize infants. And I said, well, you should. That's what the early church did. And, well, I'm not sure about that. Well, I said, look, baptism is is a new circumcision. Okay, it's the circumcision of the new covenant. What? So I I showed him Colossians chapter 2. We looked at it. Oh, I said, so just as circumcision, you didn't wait till someone was the age of reason or until they had an altar call or something or until they were 15 to circumcise them. So you shouldn't be waiting until they're adults to be baptizing them. And that's why the early church baptized babies, because they saw just like the parallel event, the entrance into the covenant. Circumcision brought you into the old covenant. Baptism brings you into the new. I said, you've got to understand this like a new creation, you see. It's, it's like what happened at the flood. It, just like Noah came out of the water at the flood. And he said, what? And I said, it's like Israel crossing the Red Sea. It's, this is typology. And he said, oh, that stuff. I, we, we're not into that, man. No, 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 no. We, keep, we hold to the Bible. As you know, as Christians, what I was quoting you, First Peter three and First Corinthians chapter ten. Turn with me, please, in your Bible. So we looked at these passages. Okay, so there's there's a big problem out there. People are not understanding the sacraments the way the early church understood them. And when we break from the early church's explanation, when we break from it, then we're breaking from apostolic Christianity. And we do that. We're going to find empty churches, churches being sold off as roller rinks and things like that, right? When the faith is no longer being preached, the apostolic faith, then you've got a dead church. All right, so let's turn now in case just before any of you decide that I'm just too crazy or maybe I'm a heretic myself, let's turn to the catechism, the catechism of the Catholic Church, and you're going to see that what we just covered is exactly what the catechism covers on baptism, okay? And I'm going to highlight some key passages for you that I think are very important. They're a little different from what a modern Christian often would think about these things. Turn with me in your catechism to paragraph 1210, and you see here the section that begins to talk about the sacraments, the seven sacraments, but it begins after a general introduction we're going to see to talk about the most important, the first three the sacraments of initiation, but I want you to notice some things here that are related to what Susan said at the beginning of our discussion. Christ instituted the sacraments of the new law. There are seven. Baptism, confirmation or chrismation. Notice the catechism mentions that. We'll get back to that in a second. The Eucharist, penance and oracle. Notice, Notice the order, just as Susan gave them to us. Right? Baptism, Confirmation, then the Eucharist, okay? The seven sacraments touch all the stages of all the important moments of life. They give birth and increase healing mission to the Christian life of faith. There is thus a certain resemblance between the stages of natural life and the stages of spiritual life. All right, and then paragraph 1211 talks about the most important of these sacraments. This is the last line in This organic whole, the Eucharist, this is the uh, last sentence there, occupies a unique place as the sacrament of sacraments. All other sacraments are ordered to it as their end. Okay, so if you want to understand the priesthood, if you understand confession, 
if you want to understand why we ordain bishops, if you understand what confirmation is, all of it, its whole purpose, it's all ordered toward the Eucharist. That should help you again understand that confirmation is primary to, in order, Eucharist, right? Baptism, confirmation, Eucharist. More on that in a second. All right, now look at the next paragraph there, 1212. The sacraments of Christian initiation, baptism, notice the order, confirmation, Eucharist, lay the foundations of every Christian life. The sharing in the divine nature given to men through the grace of Christ bears a certain likeness to the origin, development, and nourishing of a natural life. The faithful are born anew, born again. Look at that, John chapter 3. By baptism, strengthened, look at the order, by the sound of confirmation, and receive in the Eucharist the food of eternal life. Notice the order there. Okay? Paragraph 12, 13. Now the catechism moves to talk about baptism particularly. Holy baptism is the basis of the whole Christian life, the gateway to the life in the Spirit, the door which gives access to the other sacraments. Through baptism, we are freed from sin, reborn as sons of God. We become members of Christ, are incorporated into the church, made sharers in her mission. Baptism is the sacrament of regeneration through water and in the Word. Right? We're united with the Word, right, with Christ. And then the catechism, we don't need to look at all these paragraphs, in paragraph 1214 all the way through 1222, talks about the imagery of baptism that the New Testament authors talked about, as we just talked about, that baptism is a, a new creation. Baptism is, a, is like, it's like the flood with Noah and the ark. Baptism is like a cross in the Red Sea. Baptism is like the cross in the Jordan. Most importantly, baptism is like, as it says in paragraph 1223, the baptism of Jesus. The baptism of Jesus by which we become sons of God and are given our commission. Right? Okay. So Christ's baptism, the ultimate image or type to understand our baptism. Paragraph 1226 talks out also that baptism, we see this in the early church, as we looked at in Acts chapter 2. We don't need to reread these things, but in Acts chapter 2, about how when the apostles begin to preach, immediately they're preaching baptism, right? Repent and be baptized. This is paragraph 1226. Paragraph 1227, again, covers what we covered, Romans chapter 6. All right, so you can see what the catechism is doing. It's in hope, it's catechizing, right? It's trying to catechize the faithful about what is baptism? How's it doing it? By looking at the New Testament authors and the fathers of the church and how they understood the Old Testament typology. Very different from how we often talk about baptism today. Now, paragraph 1233, you can take a look at this. We're going to read this. Paragraph 1233. Today, in all the rites, Latin, so Western and Eastern. The Christian initiation of adults begins with their entry into the catechumenate and reaches its culmination in a single celebration. Underline the word single, maybe at least 10, 15 times there. Single celebration of the three sacraments of initiation. Baptism, look at the order, confirmation, and Eucharist. In the Eastern rites, Christian initiation of infants also begins with baptism, followed immediately by confirmation and the Eucharist. While in the Roman rite, it is followed, at least typically, is followed by years of catechesis before being completed later by confirmation and the Eucharist, notice the order there, the sum of their Christian initiation. Now, paragraph 1239, paragraph 1239, the essential rite of the sacrament falls baptism, properly speaking. It signifies and actually brings about, look at this language, death to sin and entry into the life of the most holy trinity through configuration of the paschal mystery of christ right his death and resurrection baptism is performed in the most expressive way by triple immersion in the baptismal form however from ancient times it has also been able to be conferred by pouring the water three times over the candidate's head <laughs> notice how the catechism talks about that it's your it's your backup plan okay it's the canteen baptism in the foxhole if you read in the Didache, in the Didache, an early, the earliest catechism we have uh, from the apostles, written sometime right around, probably around the time the apostle John was writing, it says that when you baptize, baptize in living water, that is running water, a river. In the early church, they'd always, if they could build a church, or at least a baptistry, right over a spring, 
uh, because that image of a living water, bubbling water, more on that in their lecture. And then it says, and if you can't do that, then just find a pool. And if you can't do that, then pour water over the guy's head three times. Okay? Unfortunately, that's become the norm today. How apostolic is that? It's allowed, as the catechism says, to do that. But that's not supposed to be the norm. That's not the normal sacramental uh, uh, celebration. This is why you'll find a lot of churches today, they're starting to build big baptistries again, big baptismal fonts in the back. Sometimes Catholics say, oh, that, that, that's what the Pentecostals do. Well, forget what the Pentecostals do, don't, whatever they're doing or not doing. That's what the early church did, okay? And they're doing that. You're seeing that in the architecture and the artwork and the restoration. Because a lot of what we're reading right here in the catechism. Okay, paragraph 1241. The anointing with sacred chrism, perfumed oil consecrated by the bishop, signifies the gift of the Holy Spirit. This is the immediate, this is talking about adult initiation here, confirmation immediately following. Signifies the gift of the Holy Spirit to the newly baptized, who has become a Christian, that is one anointed by the Holy Spirit, incorporated into Christ, who is anointed priest, prophet, and king. More on that later. Paragraph 1242. In the liturgy of the Eastern churches, the post-baptismal anointing is the sacrament of chrismation or confirmation. In the Roman liturgy, the post-baptismal anointing announces a second anointing with a sacred chrism to be conferred later by the bishop, which will, uh, in confirmation, which will, it will, as we're confirm or complete the baptismal anointing. Look at that word complete. Okay. So now, is, what's the catechism talking about confirmation for? We're in the wrong section. They're confused. No, because it's impossible. If you're going to talk about baptism from an apostolic and early church and proper theological perspective, it's almost impossible to avoid the topic of chrismation or confirmation because it's intertwined, as we're going to see here in a second. Paragraph 1243 talks about the, the white garment put on the person and the candle given to them as an image of that they had put on Christ, Galatians 3.27. In the early church, as they left the baptistry and went into the church carrying the candle with the white garment, they would sing Galatians 3.27. All of you who have been baptized to Christ have put on Christ, put on Christ like a garment. And they now are, paragraph 12.43, sons of God. Now, paragraph 12.62, look at this. Paragraph 12.62 talks about the grace of baptism. So what does it do? So it's some interesting imagery we saw, but what's the theology we might be asking? Give me, I want to hear the, the, what's the real stuff, right? Well, the catechism gets down to the nitty-gritty here. It says, the grace of baptism, 1262, the different effects of baptism are signified by the perceptible elements of the sacramental rite. Immersion in water, look at the word immersion, symbolizes not only death and purification, but also, underline also, maybe a couple hundred times, regeneration and renewal, right? There's your Paschal mystery, death and resurrection. Thus, the two principal effects, the two principal effects are purification from sin or death, right? And then new birth in the Holy Spirit. New birth in the Holy Spirit. So it's death and resurrection, Romans 6, right there, okay? All right, so then... Paragraph 1265 says that baptism not only purifies from all sins, but also makes the neophyte a new creation. Now, why, why does it say it that way? It not only purifies from sin, because Roman Catholics, since the Reformation, have been fighting against Protestants over the question of what does baptism do in regard to sin. All right, this is a big topic with Calvin, Luther, Zwingli, and Trent, and the Reformation, the Counter-Reformation. But what we need to do is we need to set aside apologetics for a second. This is what the catechism is trying to do is say, look, your understanding of baptism should not depend on apologetics. Okay? Yes, baptism purifies from sin. Yes, yes, yes. We've talked about that. And yes, the, the Protestants were wrong about that it does not. Yes. But there's something bigger here. It makes the neophyte, the, the, new, the new creation, an adopted son of God who has become a partaker of the divine nature for uh, 2 Peter chapter 1, verse 4. Member of Christ and co-heir with him. Co-heir. Heir of what? Heir in the resurrection, right? And a temple of the Holy Spirit. Paragraph 1267 says, We become 
baptized into Christ, we're incorporated into his body. We're incorporated into his body. And look, you can see the references are the ones I gave you. About becoming a member of the body of Christ. You become one with Christ, a member of his body. Paragraph 1271. I think it was Edwin. Edwin had said how he was thinking about baptism and, and Eucharist. He was seeing this idea of community, of unity. He's right, absolutely critical, right? Fear of Tosinu, baptism constitutes the foundation of communion among all Christians, including those who are not yet in full communion with the Catholic Church. For men who believe in Christ have been properly baptized or put in some, through though imperfect, communion with the Catholic Church. Justified by faith and baptism, they are incorporated into Christ. They are therefore a right to be called Christians and with good reason are accepted as brothers by the children by the children of the Catholic Church. Baptism therefore constitutes the sacramental bond of unity existing among all who through it are reborn. And you might, I want to ask you a question though. Edwin, when I was asking him about it, he was talking about that in reference to Eucharist, right? Communion. So which one is it? Exactly. Okay? It's because in the early church, baptism, Eucharist, baptism, confirmation, Eucharist, were all one sacramental celebration. All happened within just a few minutes. Okay? It was one event. One event. And so the early church theology, it's very hard to kind of tease out and distinguish and cut apart these different concepts. Okay? All right. Paragraph 1272 talks about how in baptism we receive an indelible mark, right? We're, we cannot be cre- repeated. Look at 1274 now. I want you to look at this together. 1274. The Holy Spirit has marked us with the seal of the Lord. For, underline the word for, maybe 300 times with some stars and things around it, right? Why has he marked us? You will say that baptism gives an indelible mark. It marks you. Why are we saying it like that? Because Protestants say it doesn't do it. It doesn't mark you. It doesn't do anything, right? But the question is, why have you been marked? For what purpose? For the day of redemption. The day of redemption. What's the day of redemption? Baptism, indeed, is the seal of eternal life. Redemption, salvation, if you were eternal life. The faithful Christian who has kept the seal until the end, remaining faithful to the demands of his baptism, will be able to depart this life marked with the sign of faith, with his baptismal faith, in expectation of the blessed vision of God, the consummation of faith, and in the hope of the resurrection. That's the last word the catechism has to say about baptism. Notice that? I think it's an important word there. So that it ends its section on baptism carefully with that one word, resurrection, resurrection. And then the catechism goes on from here to summarize in brief, as you know, the section. You can read that on your own. I would maybe have you maybe make a note for yourself to make sure you look at 1275 and 1279, 1275, 1279, where it really summarizes those key points I was making for you. Okay, that is baptism. Okay, that is baptism. We could spend a whole semester on the topic, but we're going to now move on to another topic that really can't be separated from baptism, and which is why we're talking about it in the same lecture, and that is confirmation or chrismation, or simply maybe we'd say the second sacrament of initiation or the second part of initiation. This sacrament has different names. It's a little ambiguous in the patristic tradition, how they talk about it and what it is, because it was not a distinct event, typically. It was the normal normal experience of this sacrament, this second sacrament we're going to talk about here, confirmation or chrismation, was part of the baptismal service. And so when you go back into the early church, when you look in the New Testament, for example, you really got to look hard to find a, a place where you can see somewhat of a distinction. And in fact, it's where there's actually a record of the baptismal service. You're going to see this. The fathers of the church also, as we're going to see here, talk about it as really one event. In fact, one sacrament with baptism, as we'll see St. Cyprian. Okay, so the... 
early form of this sacrament, of this other sacrament of initiation, or the second part, part two, was a laying on of hands. The simplest and earliest form is simply the laying on of the hands of the apostle upon the newly baptized. Where do we see it? Turn with me to Acts chapter 2. Acts chapter 2. We already looked at this. He said, verse 38, Repent and be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus the Christ, for the forgiveness of your sins. And, part two, you shall receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. Why is it worded like that? Well, let's look at a couple other passages in Acts that will help us understand the apostolic liturgical experience of this. Turn to Acts chapter 8. Acts chapter 8. In chapter 8, we hear about Philip the deacon. Not Philip the apostle. Philip the deacon goes to Samaria. And in Samaria, he makes some converts. Samaritans want to become Christians. Now, he's a deacon. He can baptize. So he starts baptizing. He baptizes all the Samaritans who come to Jesus. But there's a problem. Look what it says in Acts chapter uh, chapter 8, verse 14. Chapter 8, verse 14. Now, when the apostles at Jerusalem heard that Samaria had received the word of God, they sent to them Peter and John, the apostles, who came down and prayed for them that they might receive the Holy Spirit. For it had not yet fallen on any of them, but they had only been baptized in the name of the Lord Jesus. Then they laid their hands on them, and they received the Holy Spirit. Now, when Simon, the magician, saw the Holy Spirit was given by the laying on the apostles' hands, he said, hey, I've got a lot of money. Can I buy that? That's why we have that term simony, right? It's trying to buy sacraments. Okay, that's not Simon Peter. That's Simon the magician. There's another guy. All right, so, so you see that distinction there? You have a deacon who baptized. Now, don't think, don't get in your head that somehow a deacon baptism is deficient, Okay. A priest baptizing is no different from a a bishop baptizing, is no different from a a layman baptizing. That is a valid baptism. It's not deficient in comparison to another baptism, but it is deficient without the laying on of hands. And a deacon cannot confirm. Okay? So baptism, as we're going to see in the catechism, is deficient without confirmation. And so this is why the apostles were sent down there to lay hands. Peter and the apostles were there at Pentecost. They're baptizing and then laying on hands for the gift of the Holy Spirit. Here we have a deacon who baptized, and then they called for the apostles to come and lay hands on. And you can see the distinction there. You can also see it in chapter 19. Flip over to chapter 19. In chapter 19, it says this. Chapter 19, verse 5. Paul makes some some. Uh, converts of some bat, some uh, disciples of John. This is chapter 19, verse 5. On hearing this, they were baptized in the name of the Lord Jesus. Verse 6, and when Paul had laid his hands upon them, the Holy Spirit came upon them. Was there something wrong with Paul's baptism? Did he do it the wrong way beforehand? No. It's that baptism... And confirmation, or the laying on of hands, were two things they did when they baptized, when they initiated. There was the dunking in the water, and then there was the laying on of hands immediately afterwards. This is Jesus going into the Jordan and coming out, and then the Holy Spirit descending. You see the two events. Jesus went into the water, and when he came up out of the water, it says, then you saw the whole, they saw the Holy Spirit descending. The two parts. You see it? Okay, and this, by the way, we're going to talk about this in our last hour together next week. We talk about the history of the sacraments. You might be asking questions, well, wait a minute, what did, how did they do it in the second century? Well, why, wait a minute, you're talking about history, what's going on? We're going to talk about it for a whole hour next week. Okay, our last hour together is the history of these sacraments and their celebration. Where we got from, where we come from, here we, how we get to where we are today, and what's going on. Okay, so then, you can also see, you can just mark this. Uh, just for uh, speed here, Hebrews 6.2 as well. Hebrews 6.2, we hear about a washing and a laying on of hands. A washing and a laying on of hands. Hebrews chapter 6, verse 2. We also see that distinction there, okay? Now, early on, 
because they saw the laying on of hands was the gift of the Holy Spirit, they immediately started thinking of, like good Semites, olive oil. And so from a very early stage, as early as the second century, it was probably even before that, but by the second century, we have documentation that confirmation or the laying on of hands is being done with oil, with olive oil. Now, why would they do that? Well, you, we've had uh, enough classes together. You remember our, uh, our last class together, we talked about these things. If you go back to the Old Testament and you look at 1 Samuel chapter 8, right, when the people of Israel asked for a human king, then in chapter 10, Saul was presented to Samuel in 1 Samuel chapter 10. And, and Samuel poured olive oil on his head, right? And then you hear about the spirit coming mightily upon him. The oil was an outward sign of the invisible gift of the Holy Spirit. He became the Messiah. As you read in 1 Samuel chapter 12, he's the Christ. He's the Messiah, the, king, the anointed king. Well, you, know, you remember Saul didn't work out too well. So then... Then God gave them a king after his own heart, right? Not a king like the nations, but after his own heart, and that was David. So in 1 Samuel chapter 16, we hear about the anointing of David by Samuel with the pouring of olive oil on his head, and then the gift of the Spirit that mightily come upon him, right? Why would God do this? Because he's giving his spirit so that that man can do what God does, right? God is the king of Israel. He is the savior of the people. He is the ruler over the people. And now you're going to ask some human being to do this? It's a big job. So he's going to need the spirit of God to walk in the ways of God. Now, of course, Saul can resist the spirit. David can resist the spirit as we can today as well. Sorry, Calvin. So this is a gift of the spirit, but it can be resisted, as you know, tragically, in the story of Saul and David and our own lives. Right? So in the Old Testament, the gift of the Spirit was given to an individual to anoint him with oil. So the early church saw this as a beautiful image. And so very early on, we find documentation of them using oil, olive oil, in the confirmation, the chrismation service. And this is why it starts to be called chrismation, chrismation, right? Anointing, anointing. You can even hear the Greek word there. Chrismation, Christ, Christian, right? Now, in the Old Testament, the king was anointed and got the gift of the Spirit. What's interesting is that when you come to the exilic prophets and post exilic prophets, Joel, Ezekiel, you can write these down, Joel chapter 3, verses 1 through 2, Joel chapter 3, verses 1 through 2, this is what Peter quotes at Pentecost, right? that the Spirit is going to come in the new age, in the new covenant, not just upon the Messiah, not one man, but somehow upon all of God's people. In some mysterious way, all of God's people will become the Christ. They will all be anointed ones. Ezekiel talks about this in chapter 36, that he'll take out the stony heart and give you a fleshy heart by the power of says, I will put my Spirit upon you. Ezekiel 36, I'll sprinkle you with clean water and make you clean. Remember that? So the prophets start to speak of in the new covenant, the new age, that the gift of the Spirit is not going to be just given to the king of Israel, but somehow all of God's people are going to have the gift of the Spirit. Well, these are the prophets. They, they had visions and messages, and they gave them in whichever they could, but it wasn't a, a clear or understood until Pentecost when Peter saw the fulfillment of Joel and saw the Spirit descend upon all of God's people. How could that happen? Because through baptism, we enter into Jesus Christ. We become one with him. We become one with him. We become Jesus, who is the Christ, the anointed one. And this is why, it says, as it says in Acts chapter 11, that the, the followers of Jesus were called Christians there in Antioch anointed ones, little Christians, little anointed ones, little Christs. Okay. And so from that time until today, that is, you find that in use in the liturgical celebration of confirmation or chrismation, not only a laying of hands, but the, the anointing with the oil. The catechism talks more about that. 
That's the New and Old Testament imagery. Again, you said, well, that's it? That's all there is? Yeah, if you want to look more, turn with me to Galatians 3.27, Romans chapter 6, the creation story in Genesis 1, the flood story, the cross and the Red Sea. So wait a minute, didn't we already cover those? Exactly. Because there's where you find the water and the spirit. The water and the spirit. The water and the spirit. And the early church saw those images, not just simply as images of water baptism, but of baptism and chrismation as one celebration. And so that's why they refer to those texts. Okay, and so the, this is why as we look for just confirmation or chrismation, we're a little limited if we want to look at just stuff that talks about that. But if you really want to see all of it, you have to go back to Genesis 1. We have the water and the spirit. You have to go back to the crossing of the Jordan, you cross through the Red Sea, and all the images we already talked about. Okay? Okay, so now I want you to take a look at the catechism. Take a look at the catechism. This is paragraph 1285. Paragraph 1285. Baptism, the Eucharist, and the sacrament of confirmation together constitute the sacraments of Christian initiation. Now, that's the one spot in the whole catechism where you have those out of order. And it's the reason is because it's the structure of the sentence. They're trying to talk about confirmation, so they leave it at the end. Baptism, the Eucharist, and the sacrament of confirmation, which is the point of the, the sentence, together constitute, look at this, together constitute the sacraments of Christian initiation whose unity must be safeguarded. See the word unity and must and be and safeguard? Underline that, highlight that, put little stars and maybe blinking lights around that, okay? It must be explained. Must. Any DREs or catechists out there? It must be explained to the faithful that the reception of the sacrament of confirmation is, underline, necessary for the completion of baptismal grace. You can see why it's important to have the proper order then. By the sacrament of confirmation, the baptized are more perfectly bound to the church and are rich with a special strength of the gift of the Holy Spirit. Hence, they are, as true witnesses of Christ, more strictly obliged to spread them within the faith by word and deed. The Catechism goes on to talk about how in the Old Testament that there was one man was the Messiah, the anointed one, the spirit descends. And then in paragraph 1287, how all of God's people become the messianic people, right? There you can see that in that first sentence in 1287. In paragraph 1288, we hear about how in the early church, the laying on of hands was the earliest form of this sacrament. And how in paragraph 1289, the Catechism explains it very early on, though, along with the laying on hands, they began to use oil because of the rich imagery of that anointing from the Old Testament. Paragraph 1290 says, in the first centuries, confirmation generally comprised, look at this, one single celebration with baptism. Now, it's not just first century, the first centuries, okay? And actually, first centuries, you can actually, this is the first, like, thousand years, okay? In the first centuries, confirmation generally comprised one single celebration of baptism, forming with it a, quote, double sacrament. Notice the singular there, as St. Cyprian says, from North Africa. Among other reasons, the multiplication of infant baptisms all throughout the year, the increase of rural parishes, the growth of dioceses, often prevented the bishop from being present at all baptismal celebrations. You see what the, the, the paragraph is talking about. That there's, there's all sorts of things that ended up making it more complicated and harder to do that. And so it says, in the West, the desire to preserve the completion of baptism to the bishop caused the temporal separation of the two sacraments. This is critical. Underline that like 300 times. What is the reason why confirmation is delayed and separated from baptism in the early church? Only, only, so that you could wait till the bishop showed up, as with David. That was the only reason it would ever be done. It had nothing to do with age of reason, making a choice for Jesus. That's all Zwinglianism. That was, it was only because the bishop was on his way. Okay, we'll, we'll wait for the bishop, and then, and then he'll do it. It was a desire to let the bishop be the one that finished the job. Right? That is the reason for the initial early church separation of baptism and confirmation when the bishop wasn't present in some regions what they would do is just wait for the bishop they'd baptize and then wait other regions the priests were given permission 
to as the regular or the ordinary sub confirmation of chrismation. In the East, as it says here, the East has kept them united so that the confirmation of the two sacraments in the East is confirmed by the priest who baptizes, but he can only do so with the mirror on the con consecrated by the bishop. That's the image then of the presence of the bishop among them. Paragraph 1291 ends with this very important sentence, paragraph 1291, the last sentence there. If baptism is conferred on an adult, there's only one baptismal anointing, post-baptismal anointing. You may have noticed that when, you bat when a baby's baptized, that the priest pulls out some oil and, and anoints him. What's that? Oh, it's the post-baptismal anointing. Is that confirmation? No, no, it's just the post-baptismal anointing. Post anointing. What kind of oil was that? It's the sacred chrism. That's confirmation oil the priest uses. But he does not intend to confirm, and so it's not a confirmation. But you can see the relic there, as the catechism is pointing out, that that, that post-baptismal anointing there was ideally the anointing of the bishop. And this is why in an adult initiation, when you have a baptism, immediately it's going to be followed by a chrismation by the priest, or if the bishop is there, the bishop. Okay? In that case, you're not going to have a post-baptismal anointing and then a confirmation. You only have one. Okay, then paragraph 1298. 1298. When confirmation is celebrated separately from baptism, as is the case in the Roman Rite, at least typically in most people's experience, the liturgy of confirmation begins with the renewal of the baptismal promises and the profession of faith by the confirmants. This clearly shows. But why is the catechism say clearly like that? Isn't that kind of weird? This clearly shows. Is anyone debating this? Well, yeah. Because what you experience liturgically is typically what you believe. And if your experience is that confirmation is something you do as a bar mitzvah at age 15, after you've done a bunch of other things, then Theologically, in your head, your understanding the, the theology of it is not going to see a relationship of the two. This catechism came out at a time in the West when confirmation was almost universally in the West being done after Eucharist, typically in the teenagers. And so the catechism is coming into that situation. Thank God what the catechism has done is changed a lot of that. And so that today things have, have, are different. But look what it says. This clearly shows that confirmation follows baptism. When adults are baptized, they immediately receive confirmation and participate in the Eucharist. Look at the order there. You can hear the apologetic here, right? The catechism is dealing with a problem. When this catechism came out, there that was just the norm. People understood, what is confirmation? It's a bar mitzvah. It's a making a choice for Jesus. It's a time when I choose, I become an adult for Christ. That's not what the early church taught. That's not what the catechism teaches. The catechism goes on. Look what it says here. The effects. Now, just like we saw the grace of baptism, right? Now the catechism is going to deal with the effects of confirmation. Paragraph 1302. Paragraph 1302. It is evident from its celebration that the effect of the sacrament of confirmation, this is paragraph 1302, is the special outpouring of the Holy Spirit as once granted to the apostles on the day of Pentecost. Okay, so what's the catechism showing there? Just as Christ died and rose from the dead, and then there was the gift of the Holy Spirit, right? So also we, in our, our life, live that out as we come into the church. We die and are raised from the dead in baptism, and then in the new Pentecost have the Spirit descend upon us. Okay, so you, you, can, you can see how the, the catechism is showing there's, there's two aspects here, but they're, they're intimately related. You can't have Pentecost in the New Testament without the death and resurrection of Jesus. And Pentecost follows. It's, this, it's stage two of the Paschal Mystery. Okay, now, paragraph 1304. Like baptism, which it completes, underline the word completes, like baptism, which it completes, confirmation is given only once, for it too imprints on the soul an indelible mark. And it does it too? Yeah. In the early church, again, baptism, confirmation, one event, right? So if you're going to separate them, you're going to separate them out, well, you say, well, it, you receive an indelible mark. Right? 
It does not. You, what the Catholics say, Catholics say you, you don't do this twice. Once you've been baptized, you don't need to be rebaptized. Once you've been confirmed, you don't need to be re reconfirmed. Right? This changes you. All right. Paragraph 1306. Who can receive the sacrament? Now, here is where the catechism is again. You can you gotta read any work. Remember in our other classes together, what I told you, who's the author? Who's the audience? What's the, the purpose of writing, right? So when you read the catechism, you have to understand when was it written, for whom was it written? You say, well, it's written for me. Well, yeah, sort of, but it came out. The wording in it is particularly engineered for an audience that is a little different from you. Okay, and we're going to talk about that little difference here now and then also next week. That's the, some of the changes that you've seen in this sacrament of confirmation just in the last decade or two. Paragraph 1306, who can receive this sacrament? Every, underline every, then underline again. Now underline another time. Every, every baptized person not yet confirmed can and should receive the sacrament of confirmation. But well, what about age, though? Notice, notice what it did? It left that out. You know why it left that out? Because when this catechism came out, there were still babies being confirmed in Mexico City and in Manila, even in the West. Now, in America, we're, we often have our American blinders on, right? Americans often, you know, I, I love the King James onlyism. You can't get that except in the Western, you know, modern Western, you know, American world, right? This is the Bible that came out of the sky, right? This translation, Protestants are often shocked to find out that there are lots of Christians who have never read the King James Bible because they don't read English, right? The church is not just English speakers, right? Or maybe, maybe in the um, in the Roman Catholic Church. Sometimes people are surprised to know that there are a lot massive sections of the Roman Catholic Church that don't read the New American Bible or the RSV or the Dewey Reims because they read Italian or French or Spanish or something else. Right? Okay, so every baptized person not yet confirmed can and should receive the sound of confirmation. The catechism is preparing the way for something big coming with that kind of language. Notice it did not say something about age in that sentence. Now it knows the next question that's in someone's mind because the audience this was intended for, and so it goes on to address it. Since baptism, confirmation of the Eucharist, form a unity, notice the order, it follows that the faithful are obliged to receive the sacrament at the appropriate time. What about the appropriate time? What do you mean by that? For without confirmation in Eucharist, notice the order, Baptism is certainly valid and efficacious, but Christian initiation remains incomplete. Incomplete. So someone who is baptized is not yet a complete Christian. They need to be confirmed and receive the Eucharist. Then they're fully initiated into the church. Paragraph 1307. For centuries, and this is really basically in the last 500 years, for centuries, Latin custom has indicated the age of discretion. And we'll talk about why that happened in our last hour together next week. As the reference point for receiving confirmation, but in danger of death, children should be confirmed even if they have not yet attained the age of discretion. Which means the age of discretion is not a determining factor for confirmation. Right? So why then do we do it? Well, again, we're going to talk about that next week. Why did this happen? Where did we get to where we are today? Where baptism spread out from, you, from confirmation, and confirmation became this idea of a, some sort of thing to adulthood or a, 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 a bar mitzvah idea. Look at what the catechism says. It says, although confirmation is sometimes called the sacrament of Christian maturity, quote, unquote, we must not confuse adult faith with the adult age of natural growth. Hmm. I think it's a nice quote from St. Thomas Aquinas there. So the adult stage of Christianity is not to be confused with adult physical development. A person is a, is, grows into a complete human being in a certain sense, you could say, to, to their fullness of what they're going to be when they reach their adulthood, right? 
But a Christian reaches his fullness, not at some age, but rather when he has completed all three sacraments, at whatever age that might be. Okay, and then finally, we're going to end with this last note, and this just points out this this issue. This is paragraph 1314, paragraph 1314. Who can minister confirmation? Typically, in the West, confirmation is usually, in most people's experience, is associated with the bishop. But if you've got a large parish with lots of baptisms going on, especially on Pascha, on, on Easter, you've seen your priest confirming. Right? And sometimes the bishop is supposed to show up for a confirmation, and there's 20 kids waiting there, and also on the phone call, the priest comes out and does the confirmation. What? Can you do that? Yeah. In the East, as the Catechism already mentioned, in the Eastern churches, say in the Melkite church, for example, this is the norm. We just actually, on Saturday, on Epiphany, Theophany, we had a baptism of a baby at our church, and I baptized the baby, then confirmed the baby, and then there was an adult convert who I then confirmed. So that's the norm in the East. In the West, you, as in places where you have good growth happening, you see this typically as well, the priests doing the confirmations. But paragraph 1314, I want you to take a look at this. Paragraph 1314, and we'll close with this. As it talks about, in the, is what I just mentioned, the summary, in the, in the Latin West, typically the, the bishop is the ordinary. But in paragraph 1314, look what it says. If a Christian is in danger of death, any priest can give him confirmation. Indeed, the church desires that none of her children, even the youngest, should depart this world without having been perfected by the Holy Spirit with the gift of Christ's fullness. So this is something that typically people don't know, that when the priest is called for an emergency baptism at the hospital or something, quick, Father, come, the baby, we don't know if he's going to make it. The priest opens up his little emergency kit. He baptizes the baby with some holy water, and then he takes out the oil of chrism and anoints him with oil. And the person standing there watching typically thinks that the baby is simply getting a post-baptismal anointing. But no, that baby is being confirmed by the priest. In fact, according to canon law, he's required to do it. He's required. If he's prepared to baptize and confirm that baby if he thinks that baby is in danger. If, if he gets a phone call about a, a two-year-old child in his parish who's had an accident in the emergency room and it doesn't look like he's going to make it tragically, and the priest comes rushing to the hospital, this two-year-old that he had baptized as a baby, he pulls out the, his emergency kit and he confirms the baby, at least according to canon law he's supposed to. Okay, so why would they, but if that's the case, then why, what's the reason for the difference? Well, that's what we're going to talk about in the last hour together next week, and I keep mentioning that to you to make sure you're here next week. So, in summary, what did we talk about tonight? We talked about the sacraments of baptism and chrismation, or confirmation, as the first two sacraments, holy mysteries, of initiation. And we talked about them together, even though it was a bit rushed. I would have liked to have had two hours on baptism and two hours on confirmation. But it's good that we held these together so that in your mind, if you're saying right now, well, wait a minute, okay, I'm, I, you were talking so fast, I'm not sure whether you were talking about baptism at one point or you were talking about confirmation. You were talking about the Holy Spirit over here and then over there and the, and the, and the anointing here, but then up there. Exactly. What happened is in the post-Reformation era, as the Reformers were asking questions about the the sacraments, if you know anything about the Reformation, that was their attack. What are the sacraments? What do they do? How many are they? What are their effects? Those are the debates. Calvin, Zwingli, Luther were debating each other about this stuff. And then Council of Trent was called to answer the errors of Luther, Calvin, and Zwingli on what are the sacraments, how many are there, and what are their effects. And so they had to slice and dice and talk about this and that. And this. But in the early church experience, baptism, confirmation of the Eucharist, were experienced in one liturgical event. 
as you hopefully see in your parish, at least on the Paschal evening. And remember a very important principle. It goes all the way back to the fathers. Lex orandi, lex credendi. As we pray, the rule of prayer is the rule of faith. And so it's very important if we're going to understand the sacraments of baptism, the Eucharist, and the liturgy, is to understand the liturgical celebration of them. I, and what I mean by that is not what might be happening at your local parish. What might be happening at a particular parish where you grew up may not be in accord with. I don't know what the teaching of the church is on the side. Who knows what's going on? But hopefully what you're experiencing on a regular basis is in accord with the teachings of the church in which you see at least an adult initiation still preserved in that ancient Paschal liturgy, the proper order and unity being preserved of baptism, confirmation, and the Eucharist. Next week, we'll talk about the relationship of the Eucharist to confirmation. Okay? Most people think of the Eucharist as be relating to baptism. If I asked you, who can receive the Eucharist? Say, anyone who's been baptized? Just one century ago, if I were to say, anyone who's been baptized, you would say, and confirmed, don't you mean? And confirmed, because it was unheard of just one century ago. Just one century ago. It was unheard of in the history of the church for anyone to receive the Eucharist without first being confirmed. Okay, so it's important to understand the relationship of baptism and the Eucharist. And what is in between them? The baptism is the doorway to confirmation, the gift of the Spirit. And the gift of the Spirit is the doorway to the Eucharist. And we'll talk about next week how important that is and what the Catechism says about that and why it's so important to understand the early church celebration and the history of these sacraments to understand that relationship. And now I think we can go to a question and answer, right, Andy? Yep, thank you so much, Father. First question's from Lori Wynn. She asks, do you need to be baptized again if you were baptized only in the name of Jesus? Ah, great question. One that I didn't have time to answer in our main part here. Andy only gives me so much time to talk here, so this is extra bonus time. Okay, so... The name of Jesus. Where is this question coming from? The question is arising from modern experience. Modern Protestant sects, denominations, which are growing at a rate which is dizzying. There's already, already over something like 45,000 denominations and more. But modern denominations are developing, and what they're doing is they're separated from one group, separate from another, and what they do is they pick up their Bible, and they start looking, and like looking in a recipe book, Joy of Cooking, Try and figure out how to bake the bread, right? How to, how, to, how to make a church. And so one of the problems is they come into Acts the Apostles, not understanding author, intended audience, and purpose of writing, and see that in Acts, there's this thing called baptism in the name of Jesus. Oh. And so it became popular in American Protestantism in some, some small sects. Typically, you'll find, them among, you'll find this happening among Pentecostal groups sometimes, sometimes among Foursquare, Assembly of God will sometimes do this. Typically, I've experienced it among Pentecostals. But this, again, this is American Protestantism. Baptism in the name of Jesus. They'll dunk the person once, say, I baptize you in the name of Jesus. Say, why would you do it that way? Because that's what the Bible says. And look here in Acts. They're baptized in the name of Jesus in Acts. And you say, well, what about the end of Matthew's gospel? It says, baptize in the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. I don't know. There's only one reference to that. But look at Acts. There's three references or four references about his name of Jesus. So we're going to just go with that one, okay? Okay. So what's the problem? Acts the Apostles talks about a baptism in the name of Jesus because there were two types of baptisms going on in the early church. There was the baptism of John, the Baptist. Many of Jesus' followers, his first apostles, and many of the people who came into the church and followed Jesus, originally converted in the, in the period of Acts, were, had already been baptized by John, the Baptist. That was the baptism of John. 
And you can see this problem in Acts 19, where Paul, a text we already looked at, in Acts 19, Paul comes to Ephesus, and he finds some believers. He starts talking to them, he's realizing something's wrong, something's missing here. And he says, were you baptized? Oh, yeah. In what to you were you baptized? Well, in the baptism of John. What other kind of baptism is there? John's baptism was intended to point to Jesus. I mean, the baptism of Jesus, John was a baptism of repentance. Jesus, his baptism gives the Holy Spirit. Oh, well, we'd like to have that too. Okay, so he baptizes them in the name of Jesus. And then they receive, and he lays his hands on them, they receive the Holy Spirit. We looked at this in, John, in Acts 19. You can see the tension going on right there. You see it? But if you read across the apostolic literature, if you look at Matthew's gospel, you look at the Didache, if you look at all the early apostolic writings, you find that when they baptize and they give instructions, when you baptize, this is how you're going to do it. They say, you dunk them three times, and they have the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit. Acts the Apostles has this reference to baptism in the name of Jesus because the historical context in which they're trying to make a contrast of there's two kinds of baptism, the baptism of John versus the baptism of Jesus. Okay? Andy, anything else? Uh, Chrissy asks, uh, was there ever a time in the Bible where someone received the Holy Spirit before they were baptized? And if that was the case, what do we do? Yeah, Acts chapter 10, Cornelius. So in Acts chapter 10, Peter goes to the house of Cornelius. And again, you got to have context here. I remember listening to it was Jimmy Swaggered on this text. He was, he was talking about, yeah, see, baptism is given after the gift of the Spirit. You see, the gift of the Spirit is, always comes first. Then you get baptized as a public showing, right? And look, at, look, turn to Acts chapter 10 with me. Well, this is the only example of that, okay? So, but what's going on in Acts chapter 10? Again, context. Peter and some of the Jewish believers have come to Cornelius' house in Caesarea of Maritime, a pagan Gentile city. And they had not yet baptized a single uncircumcised individual. And Peter's preaching the gospel to them. You remember this in Acts 10. And the believers, the Jewish Christians with Peter, thinking, when are we going to get out of here, Peter? Get your words out. Let's get out as fast as we can. And then all of a sudden, the Spirit descends upon them. Oh, no. And the, the believers who were with him from among the circumcised saw that the Spirit had been given even to Gentiles. Now what do we do? So Peter says, quick, get some water. Right? we got to regularize the situation. So it was an example of where the church was dragging its feet. It refused to baptize the Gentile uncircumcised image. And so God showed them that the Spirit was intended for Gentiles too, whether they're circumcised or not, whether they're kosher or not. So God gave them the Spirit right there in front of the apostles. And Peter says, oh, all right, well, I guess we got to baptize the Gentiles. So then they started baptizing. And then you see in every other example, when they go and baptize the Gentiles, then you see the Spirit descend. Okay? Madison asks, in Luke chapter 12, verse 50, it says, Quote, there is a baptism with which I must be baptized, and how great is my anguish until it is accomplished, unquote. He's already been baptized, though, right? So what is this trying to say? Beautiful, beautiful question. That's in, uh, in Luke chapter 12. This is, Jesus is on his way to the cross, right? Jesus was baptized in Luke chapter 3, but there's another, another baptism coming. That's his death and resurrection, right? It's not a water baptism. He's speaking in theological poetry here, right? Remember when there's other places where the apostles, right? This is in Matthew's got the apostles. They want to be on, on his left and on his right. And he says, can you be baptized in my baptism? They say, oh, yeah, sure. You don't understand what you're talking about. So he's talking about his death and, and resurrection that's coming. Will you be able to do that? And so uh, his baptism, he's in, in anguish until that comes. He's talking about his coming death and resurrection. Okay, and it's theological poetry. It's like when Jesus is in the in the Garden of Gethsemane. He says, "Let this cup pass from before me." He doesn't really actually have a cup sit in front of him or in front of an olive tree there, and he wants to move it over aside and get out of his way so he can pray. It, he's talking about this experience, right? The thing which you drink. Uh, and so, again, even Jesus compared his death and resurrection to that when he's talking to the apostles, right? When James and John, sons of Zebedee, when their mother came up to Jesus on the way to Jerusalem. He says, hey, can my boy sit on your left and on your right when you come into your kingdom? Which she thought when he goes into Jerusalem and destroys the Romans, right? And he says, 
uh, can you guys drink from the cup I'm going to drink from? And I said, oh, yeah, we, we'll do that. We'll share a cup with you. Yeah, we'd like to do that. I always like cup. You always have nice wine. And, and sit on the right and on the left, uh, the king was to share from his cup. They got a big bowl, right, to drink from. This is before we had our little wine glasses. So, yeah, yeah, we'll share a cup with you, Jesus. Of course we'll drink wine from your cup. Okay, you'll share my cup, right? When he's talking about his coming death and resurrection, right? And in fact, James and John, remember, they end up being the first and last of the apostles to die, okay? Father, can our local bishop change the uh, order of baptism, confirmation, and then the Holy Eucharist? Okay, so that is a topic I'll just mention briefly just to make sure you show up next week. The order of the sacraments, what did they do in the early church, and how do we get to where we are today? And you probably have already heard, by looking at this catechism, and you probably have heard from other from dioceses maybe around you, that there's bishops who are doing something strange. They're restoring the order of the sacraments. It's spreading like wildfire. Honolulu, Denver, Phoenix, oh, no, I can't even keep track of them all. Every time you turn on the internet, you find another one that did it. Where it's these very highly educated young conservative bishops who are coming in and saying, you know what? Enough is enough. We're going to do it right. I don't care whether you don't like it. You're catechists. You've got to throw away some of your books and start over. I know. So God to be restored if we're going to restore the faith in these dioceses and in these parishes. And so these bishops are saying, this is the only way to do it. So every bishop has the right to restore the order of the sacraments in his diocese. Now, in the East, we already have that. Of course, it would never change that. But in the West, this happened in 19, it was 1932 when the official permission was given that in special circumstances, if the bishop couldn't be there in, in, in the kid's childhood, but he could only show up like maybe when the kid was 15 or something, okay, fine, then you can give him the Eucharist beforehand so that you don't deprive them of the Eucharist. This is Pius X earlier in a document, Quam Singulari, also talking about this, where in France they were putting off Eucharist until like age 18 in some diocese. And the argument was, well, the diocese is so big, and I can't get over there, and I, you know, I don't have a car. And so Pope Pius X said, that's an abuse. But if, if, you're really, if it's really the case that the bishop can't get there until the kid's in his teenage years, and fine, you can leave confirmation until that time, but you got to give them the Eucharist, at least by they come, they come to the age of reason, that was intended as an exception in certain strange situations from France spread and became the norm from 1932 until today. So, so much so that, again, remember the principle, Lex Arani, Lex Credendi. So what people experience in liturgy, what they see celebrate, is what they end up understanding and believing about these sacraments. So that's why the, these bishops in these conserved dioceses are saying, no, 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 wait, we got to restore this thing. Because if our people don't understand baptism and its relationship to the confirmation, then they're not going to understand the Eucharist. And we're going to continue sliding downhill on the belief in the real presence. And so in these dioceses where the bishops restoring these things, they get they fight. The catechists fight against them, right? The catechists, well, wait, I've got all my books lined up. I've got all my publications and everything's worked out. In sixth and seventh grade, we do this. In eighth grade, we do that. I don't care. It hasn't worked. It hasn't worked. Besides the Protestant model anyway. You don't educate by Sunday school. You educate by the liturgy. All right. Uh, but more on that next week. Thank you so much, Father, for leading us through this. And we're just grateful for your uh, expertise in leading us through the text. So we appreciate it. May God bless you, and we will see you, God willing, next week. Glory be to the Father, and to the Son, and the Holy Spirit, both now and ever, and to age of ages. Amen. We hope you enjoyed this presentation from the Institute of Catholic Culture. If you'd like to learn more about the mission of the Institute and how you may become a part of this important work, please visit our website at www.instituteofcatholicculture.org or call us at 540-635. 7155. And may the glory of Christ Church be evermore manifest upon the earth. St. John the Evangelist, pray for us.